Previously, Ryan served as the Senior Vice President, Senior Portfolio Manager, and Team Lead of the Sierra Pacific Group at Morgan Stanley. Ryan started his career in the wealth management industry at Edward Jones, where he grew to be the largest producer in the country for his length of service. In 2020, Ryan, in fact, was named to the Forbes Top 20 Best in State Wealth Advisors for Nevada. He has over 12 years of industry experience and is a certified financial planner with Series 7 and Series 66 licenses, as well as all lines of insurance. Prior to wealth management industry, Ryan had another career. He spent some 12 years on active duty serving as a naval aviator, where he logged nearly 3,000 flight hours and 256 carrier landings. Ryan fully retired honorably from the United States Navy in 2017. Ryan graduated from Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas, with a BS in finance and economics. We're glad he made his way westward to California. He completed his graduate work at the Harvard Business School and is an active member of the Harvard Business School Alumni Association. Ryan has been giving presentations for the UCSD Retirement Association for the past 12 years. He is part of our elite cadre of preferred professional providers and our people we consider to be the best in their field who give excellent community service presentations for our members. And of course, each month, Ryan presents a new topic for our monthly investments interest group that is today, though on the fourth Tuesday of each month from 12 to 1 p.m. Welcome, Ryan. Welcome, everyone. How are you doing today? Um, thank you for having me. As always, Suzanne, I appreciate the <clears throat> wonderful introduction. Um, difficult subject today because I think we're all aware of the humanitarian crisis. Um, we've seen the news and uh, the, the videos and the pictures and everything of what's going on. So uh, keep in mind, as I go through this, I'm talking about the economic side. I don't think there's any way uh, that we can quantitate, quantify excuse me, uh, the humanitarian side and what's happened. For many of you out there that know me well, um, I actually served in two wars myself, Operation Enduring Freedom in 04, 05 on the USS Enterprise, and then uh, in Iraqi Freedom 07 and 08, uh, on the USS Harry S. Truman as an F-14 and C-2 pilot. And I've been shot at before as well. And so I can tell you, having been to war, um, having experienced that, it's just, it's beyond human comprehension that we even are in these positions in 2022. So I want to keep that as a backdrop. Uh, as someone that is a veteran who has been to war, uh, I, I understand the gravity of what we're discussing today. And um, I am coming at you from an economic impact because I think it is important that we know, you know, what is the or the long term ramifications and fallout. But I want to keep in the back of our mind that there's a humanitarian crisis going on here that is beyond reproach. So uh, that being said, let's go ahead and jump in. And then, of course, you know, if anybody has questions, as always, I'll write my uh, email address here in the, the chat and then you can always. Um, put your questions here in the chat as well. I'll monitor that as we go through the various slides. So again, this uh, investment interest group is for all of you. Uh, so please, <clears throat> thank you, Suzanne, I appreciate that. Um, this, this is for you. So please do not hesitate as we go along to you know, put questions in the chat or unmute yourself and uh, feel free to jump in and ask a question because we're gonna go over some stuff that I normally don't go over. We're gonna talk about commodities today. We're gonna talk about what they are how they're affected, uh, how the global markets have responded uh, to uh, the Russian intervention in Ukraine. Um, and we'll discuss you know, how that's going to affect uh, US uh, concentric and US uh, derived portfolios, okay? So let's, let's jump into it with the first slide here. Just as a reminder, my last two months in February, we discussed, um, or excuse me, in January, we discussed inflation, uh, which is obviously very pertinent to what's going on in the world. And then in February, uh, we talked about, so, um, actually about tax 
uh, advantage portfolios, but I did a small segment on this tail risk that would have been the Russian invasion of Ukraine. If you recall, um, most prognosticators, whether it was news, financial markets, were saying that the, the, the probability of a Russian incursion or invasion into Ukraine was a very small probability. Well, sometimes these tail risks in the markets happen, um, and they uh, certainly affect uh, you know, how investments move around the world, how capital is reallocated, et cetera, et cetera. So next slide real quick. I just want to put up what I put last month as one of my slides, and this is just a copy of the first three slides or just a copy from last month. I said, and this is before the invasion began, which was approximately 20, 25 days ago. I said, you know, our conviction is that any Russian invasion should favor U.S. stocks, right? A broad-based commodity exposure as well. Commodities being kind of the fundamental things of life, right? Oil is one you're probably most familiar with, but the metals, palladium, gold, silver, copper, uh, there's also the food commodities, wheat, corn, frozen concentrated orange juice, um, you know, soybeans, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then there's a futures market also uh, with commodities or commodity futures as well. So I think it's important to understand that uh, we, we, we certainly couldn't see this tail risk coming, but what we could do is prepare portfolios for that. And that's what we're here to discuss. And then what do we do going forward, right? Um, one of the things... Uh, another thing that we are going to be overweight is going to be U.S. concentric cyclical sectors and then the balance between quality and that cyclical. And we're certainly going to be underweight fixed income, and I'll show you why here in a second, or bonds, and underweight international markets, and I'll show you why. Next slide. So, you know, conviction is uh, most simply that we do not expect – we can jump to the next slide because I covered most of this – is that we do not expect – a U.S. economic recession this year based on uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Conversely, we do expect a potential soft to medium recession in European markets. We'll go over why here in a second. Um, so again, that's why we are going to, uh, in, in our particular business, why we are underweight portfolios that have large exposure to Europe and emerging markets, which would include, include Russia, and why we want to be overweight U.S. markets and particularly ones that are going to be leveraged to the economic cycle and not leveraged to interest rates, All right? So next slide. Next slide. So let's take a little history lesson here, and this goes back to uh, the Russian invasion of Crimea back in 2014. You could see at the bottom of my slide here. We have January through December of 2014, so we have the entire year, and we have four different lines here. We have the Russian stock market in red. We have the Russian bond market in orange. The ruble, which is the Russian currency in green. And we have crude oil, right? So there we're West Texas Intermediate when I say crude oil, uh, in gray. And what we could see is the initial invasion of uh, Crimea or the annexation of Crimea in uh, late February of 2014 caused the Russian stock market to initially have a large downturn. The ruble stayed pretty much flat. But we didn't see much of an oil spike in the beginning, right? As we saw sanctions come in in uh, late April, early May, U.S. sanctions and then EU sanctions in July. That's when we got our oil peak at $115 a barrel back in 2014. And then you could see a precipitous drop in, in uh, <clears throat> oil prices after that as the world kind of recognized uh, what the true production and the true effect uh, of the uh, – uh, Russian oil market is on the global supply of the global oil market, okay? Um, one thing you can see there is there was a significant downturn in the Russian market, roughly 50 to 60% in stocks, bonds, down 20 plus percent. Now, let's compare that to today and what has happened in Ukraine. Next slide. The Russian stock market, and this is the <clears throat> stock market in Russia from early March of 2020, right? So you see on the very left here, that's the pandemic low, uh, March of 2020. And then we see today, all the way over on the right, you see the red arrow coming out. So, you know, almost down 50% more from the pandemic low in 2020. So again, I think it's important to understand, the, certainly U Ukraine, humanitarian crisis there, but there are a lot of people in Russia as well that are certainly, and we've seen this on the news as well, not for this war, right? This is more of a political thing. Obviously, the president, Putin, um, unilaterally 
uh, makes these decisions. And the effect on the Russian people is also going to be substantial. When I say substantial, I mean depression types substantial. Okay. So the Russian market has been closed since the invasion. And at the day of the invasion, it was down 83% from its high. That would be equivalent to uh, the Great Depression here in 1929 and the crash in October 1929. Okay. So just a horrific wipeout of uh, of market capitalization for companies in Russia. Next slide. This is the ruble. So if you just go back to 2010, uh, basically for every dollar you get 30 rubles, and now for every dollar you get roughly 110 rubles. What does that mean? That means that the valuation of the currency makes everything in Russia significantly more expensive for, for people that are trading in that currency or buying things in that currency, which just <clears throat> continues to exacerbate uh, the uh, economic depression that the country of Russia will start significantly feeling here probably in the next two, two weeks to a month, you're going to see a massive, massive depression in Russia due to the economic sanctions and due to the collapse of the ruble and the equity markets in Russia. Again, it's, when you have equity markets that collapse, equity markets is where capital is you know, for, for creating projects and growth and everything else. And if your market capitalization of your stock market is down 80, 85%, it's pretty easy to see that um, there's no money whatsoever from the international community going to Russia. Next slide. This is just a screenshot I took yesterday uh, of the Russian market. Again, you can see pretty much trading at 1500 there just in the early days of February and now, you know, down well below 600. So again, a 75, 80% drop in the uh, Russian market. Next slide. So <clears throat> when we think about Russia and the influence that Russia has, uh, and particularly Ukraine as well, um, how the effect of the, the global market. So Russia, before uh, the invasion of Ukraine, accounted for about 2% of world GDP, right? So not a very large economy when you think of it in a world context. Um, but what they are is a significant producer of what we call commodities, right? And so Russia's invasion of Ukraine has world capital markets, more based on fear and what could be next, right? Because of the large size of the commodity production in the region, right? And so with its focus on food and energy production, and we'll focus on those two parts of the commodity markets, it can aggravate inflation that was already rising to levels that pose economic risk. One of the things that you'll see today uh, and some of the slides I have and some of the research I did for this presentation is the inflationary pressures that we're seeing today. And again, I don't ever make these political, but I know politics has deemed, oh, this is Putin's inflation, this and that and the other. That's not correct. And I'll show you in the charts and I'll show you in energy prices and food prices that inflation was already on a significant upward swing. Almost 50 percent of the inflationary prices in oil and gas occurred before the Russian invasion. Right from where they were previous, or at least from where they were at the beginning of 2021, and we'll go over that in a second. All right. So again, it's a confluence of events of why you're seeing this massive inflation, and I'm not so much talking to like maybe of housing, but again, we're talking uh, focused on energy and food. All right. Next slide. So commodities, what are they and what do they fall into? They normally fall into four different groups, right? Food, energy, industrial metals, and precious metals. So the first two, food and energy, are what we're really going to focus on because that is what <clears throat> Russia and Ukraine are known for, and that's both are Russia's top export from its country, right, are, is uh, energy, uh, particularly natural gas and oil, right? And it's the number one source of their GDP and their annual budget, right? So it's also the number one thing that funds um, their, uh, the war in Ukraine and, you know, their military and everything else. Unlike the U.S., uh, they don't have the U.S. Treasury backed by the U.S. dollar, so they, don't, they can't sit there and um, uh, issue unlimited amount of treasuries to finance wars overseas, unlike the United States. The world fears food supply uh, restrictions most due to its uh, tie to social instability, right? Global food source is an incredibly... In if you have a country, especially, and we're thinking outside of the U.S. here because the U.S. can sustain its uh, food through um, uh, just U.S. production. But there are many countries throughout the world, particularly with wheat and corn, that are dependent on the exports from Russia and Ukraine to essentially feed their nation, right? And so this can lead to incredible social instability. So there is a concern in certain parts of the world um, 
that the social instability could lead to other economic and government problems within their specific nations. Next slide. Just a quick graph here. Uh, so let's let's break this apart real quick. Uh, the economic sanctions and really get a, a handle here on who Russia's main trading partners are. You can see over on the top left, only 3% of Russia's exports go to the United States. So the United States extending all of these sanctions, yes, it looks great, like a big virtue signal, right? It looks great. We're you know eliminating energy um, uh, imports from Russia, food imports from Russia, fertilizer imports from Russia. But the reality is only 3% of Russia's exports go to the United States in the first place. Who is Russia's number one trading partner? Well, it's right there in the middle, top middle of the screen. 50% of Russia's exports go to the European Union, right? And so if we really, really want to tear apart Russia's source of income to fund the war in Ukraine. It's got to come from Europe and the European Union. One of the reasons, again, that we're predicting a recession uh, towards the end of this year, particularly if Europe uh, turns off its energy um, imports from Russia or its natural gas import from Russia or even potential its food import from Russia, it's got to, to fulfill that from somewhere else. And the problem with that is where do they get it and how do they get it? And it would essentially cause a significant slowdown in their economies, which is, again, why we're predicting a recession by the end of the year in the European Union. OK, so what has Russia lost out? Well, you can see right there in the first money bag, 55 billion immediately knocked out from the largest companies in Moscow and in Russia on their stock exchange. We talked about that earlier. 160 billion of Russian enterprises and individual assets. Think of oligarchs. You probably read a lot about that in the news. In Western banks are now frozen, right? Eight billion worth of international loans will not be available to the 10 largest Russian uh, companies. So funding, capital improvement projects, labor, anything else, that spigot's been turned off as well. And then 11 billion has already been spent by the central bank of Russia to try to curb the ruble's fall, to try to prevent this incredible decrease in the value of their currency, okay? Next slide. So what are the largest or the percentage of total global production of raw materials attributed to Russia? Remember, from a land standpoint, Russia is the largest country in the world, right? It, is, uh, it spans, I believe, eight, nine, or 10 uh, time zones. We're here in the US, we're three, if you include Alaska and Hawaii, five. But Russia spans, actually, I believe it's 10 times up. So literally almost halfway around the world from a land perspective. So they have all these natural resources, right? There's so much land. So as a portion, proportion of total global produ production, you can see over in the very far left, corn, they're about 4% of the, the world uh, source of corn. You can see nickel, crude oil, crude oil, about 11%. Again, on the previous slide, I talked about supplying about 50% of European energy but only two to three percent of U.S. energy or crude oil, right? And then the biggest stuff: uh, titanium, potash, and palladium. Particularly palladium and potash, and uh, both of those are both produced in Ukraine and Russia. And so you're bringing off roughly a third to half of the world supply of palladium. Palladium, what does it go into? Think of catalytic converters. Think of car production, right? And so. Um, you could have a, a significant uh, effect or a, uh, a tail risk within the car industry and potentially one of the reasons for car prices, particularly new cars, going up significantly in, in value because of the reduced supply. Next slide. So going back, and again, why uh, this is the facts about U.S. imports of Russian oil. So this is who we actually get our oil from. Okay, if we look at U.S., and again, this is what we import, right? You know, U.S., uh, the, the majority of the U.S. oil consumed in the U.S. is actually U.S. oil. Um, but if we look at where we import it from, you can see our, our, our largest trading partner right now, today, in 2022, is Canada. Obviously a friendly nation for us. All other countries combined, uh, you know, roughly a million, million and a half barrels a day. If we look at OPEC, uh, we've significantly reduced our our reliance on OPEC, particularly since the mid 2000s, which has uh, taken a large cut out of their uh, of the OPEC cartels uh, influence on the world oil markets, uh, is certainly significantly higher in other parts of the world. But right now, in case you didn't know this, the largest producer of oil in the world is the United States. Okay, 
And so you could see Russia, the little red line Russia there is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of overall imports of, uh, of, of oil here in the United States. So turning that off, not that big of a deal whatsoever. So then the question begs, well, then why are oil markets spiking? Well, we're going to go into that in a second. There's a couple different factors at play here. Next slide. As I said at the beginning of the presentation, and again, this is not political in any way, shape, or form. This is just numbers. Okay, if we look at West Texas Intermediate Crude, price per barrel, 2019, okay, the end of 2019 to December 31st of 2019, it was $60 roughly a barrel. At the end of 2020, we had the pandemic, we had the recession, it fell to $48.52, right? So roughly a fall of 20% from 2019 to 2020. If we look from 2020 to 2021, and we look at the, the percent differential, by the end of 2021, again, this precedes the invasion in Ukraine, this precedes the buildup, the large buildup of troops on the Ukrainian border, oil prices were already up 71.8%, okay? Or at least to the peak change. So they were up 2020 to 2021, 54.3%. To the peak of 2021, they were up 71.8%. And 2021 to 2022, they're up 22.6%. So the bottom line here, is the majority of the increase in energy prices occurred before, or excuse me, oil price, not energy as a total, of, uh, oil, or excuse me, oil prices, which then coincidentally goes into gas prices, occurred before the Ukrainian invasion. And so what are some of the reasons behind that? And what do we think uh, could be a cause of that? Well, it's the same thing that's caused housing prices to go through the roof. It's the same thing that's caused food prices to go through the roof. You have too much demand chasing limited supply, right? So if you have limited supply and you've got unlimited demand coming out of the pandemic, you have demand that's been brought forward that was suppressed during the pandemic, and then you have supply chain issues, right? You have um, uh, policies, uh, and again, you know, we could talk about political side, but policies that encourage people, you know, potentially not to work or to stay at home um, or to um, flood the markets with monetary policy, meaning keeping interest rates extremely low uh, beyond how long they should have been kept low, um, then you're going to have increased demand, which without corresponding increased supply will drive the price up significantly. And that's what we're seeing. And that's why the majority of the increase in gas prices, or excuse me, gas prices, oil prices actually occurred before the Russian invasion. Next slide. So share of global grain exports. Right here's where the inflation really came in uh, due to the invasion in Ukraine. So share of global grain exports between Russia and Ukraine account for roughly a, uh, a quarter of the entire world's exports of global grain. Right. So this is food. This is very important to sustain um, the natural world food source. And so taking out a quarter of that needs to be picked up from somewhere else so that we don't have imbalances. And that's one of the biggest issues and one of the main reasons, again, choking off 25% of the supply, you have an increase in price, thus significant increase in price. Next slide. So who do they export most of their wheat products to, right? So Ukraine's wheat products, number one importer was Egypt, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Turkey, can go down the list. What is the one thing that we, we, we can derive from most of these countries, except for possibly Turkey, is that the third world countries. Again, the fear in some of these countries is that you would have that political instability due to shortages of food supplies, right? So there are ramifications that kind of, as the, the, the snowball keeps going downhill, right? Um, and we continue to limit supply out of Ukraine and Russia of wheat exports, it will eventually uh, affect these other nations as well. Next slide. So if we look at U.S. farmers alone, these are the variable costs that go into um, a, a farmer here in the U.S., meaning uh, what varies from year to year. You can see down at the bottom there where the arrow is kind of covering a little bit, fertilizer accounts for 11 percent. Largest producers of fertilizer in the world, again, Russia and Ukraine. And you can see up there animal feed, again, talking about grains, about 24 percent. So from a standpoint of a farmers of variable costs and, again, food supply, the effect of the Russian invasion of Ukraine could affect over a third of their variable costs. That's a substantial portion. And again, that they are going to transmit those price increases down the food chain. Next slide. 
All right, so another slide here with um, some specifics on uh, selected energy exports from Russia. So you can see coal at the top, natural gas and crude oil. One of the things people don't realize about Russia is they're actually, they're, they're a net exporter of energy. That's their number one source of their economy, right? Uh, but they actually export more natural gas, 74% versus crude oil at 49%, all right? So natural gas, well, where does it go? Almost 75% of the natural gas exported um, from Russia goes to the European Union, right? And so again, this is why we're calling for a potential recession in the European Union and why we've gone underweight, not just underweight, but almost completely eliminated from all of our portfolios any exposure to developed markets in Europe at this point. Next slide. So if we go back to OPEC, and I said that they've been defanged somewhat since the uh, uh, mid 2000s. This is OPEC. Again, OPEC is just the oil producing economies and countries, mostly Middle Eastern countries. Uh, a cartel that's formed to essentially control uh, supply of, of oil throughout the world, right? So you can see their spare capacity on the right is only about four and a half million barrels a day at this point, right? And so the spare capacity is down around six and a half percent. What does that mean? It means that OPEC cannot increase capacity significantly to uh, balance out the world oil supply. Next slide. Here's the share of European Union natural and liquefied natural gas imports. Again, you can see down at the bottom there, the red, it's pretty apparent, especially from 2002 to 2020, they've become more and more um, dependent on Russian natural gas than anywhere else throughout the world. Right? And so this has created a situation where the economies are interdependent on each other. Right? And so you have this huge disruption of the invasion. And oh, by the way, where does the, the, the largest pipeline of natural gas from Russia to the European Union, where does it flow right through? Right through Ukraine. Right? And so again, this disruption is, you know, and I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here, is why we're calling for a European recession mid to late this year. Next slide. So this is the domestic production versus imports, right? So you can see domestic natural gas uh, versus uh, pipeline imports. So they're roughly producing half of their, their natural gas in uh, Europe and UK, uh, and then the rest of it they're getting from imports. So that is a you know, supply that they have to replace of roughly 50% of the natural gas that they, they consume on an annual basis. Next slide. So what are the implications? Well, for investors, the sharp rise in commodity prices, again, fueling additional consumer price inflation globally, right? So we here in our firm raised our 2022 year-end targets for inflation, lowered our GDP growth forecast, not just uh, in Europe in emerging markets, but also in the U.S. due to inflation, right? Because what does inflation do? It cuts off demand, consumer demand. In addition, it requires the Fed monetary policy to increase interest rates. Increasing interest rates <coughs> cuts off uh, consumer demand as well as the price of lending, the price of uh, uh, debt becomes significantly higher, right? So while we do expect global commodity supplies to remain tight in 2022 and prices high, uh, we actually downgraded commodities because as you'll see in some charts I have here in a second, uh, you got to remember markets try to lead, uh, you know, these, these price hikes and the, the, the reduction in supply and the increase in demand. And as you'll see in some of the charts I have here in a second, we've seen these blow off tops, these, these huge spikes in commodity prices that probably indicated a, a short term uh, topping process in the commodity space. So if I can give you some good news, it does look like the worst of, uh, of the commodity uh, ex price explosion and the worst of inflation from a year over year perspective doesn't mean inflation is going to suddenly stop. But the worst of it from a percentage increase is probably in the rearview mirror. Next slide. But we also expect slower growth in emerging markets. I said that before, in the European economic recession later in 2022. We do not believe that recession will come to the United States. The consumer is still very strong here. We still have very accommodative um, uh, monetary policy, although that is becoming much more hawkish. But we still have a, a pretty strong economy here in the U.S., in particular in the labor market. All right. Next slide. So just wanted to show you a couple of the charts that I pulled off on commodities here. And so this is uh, West Texas Intermediate Sweet Crude. And if you look there in, in early March, that spike of $130 a barrel, does it mean that we can't go back up there? Absolutely not. 
but that ch chart shows a, a speculative blow off top in that particular commodity. If you just take a trend line from December and you run it up through, through today, that should be where, where the trend line goes, right? So you see that big blow off top like that. That means that was speculation and more likely fear towards the beginning of the invasion or a couple of weeks in when we didn't know what was going to happen, potentially getting the West involved or NATO involved in some type of World War III scenario. As those tail risks come off the table, then uh, commodity prices started to ease. Next slide. All right, this is just palladium. Again, seeing the same exact spike in palladium that we saw in West Texas Intermediate. Next slide. And then this is wheat, right? And so again, uh, if we look at wheat here, you can see that huge spike, and now we're stabilizing in the commodity prices as well. So what am I showing you all these squiggly lines and charts for? Just showing you that these spikes in, in, in the commodity prices, which of course leads to massive inflation, we've probably seen the highest of it in these blow-off tops. And so if you are in your portfolios, again, overweight commodities, overweight uh, maybe oil companies, uh, you may want to start taking some profits off the table and you may want to start <clears throat> reallocating to other investments. Next slide. So let's talk United States specific. We went over Russian implications. We went over EU and EM. Let's talk about the United States for a second and what we see here for the next uh, uh, short term. I'd say, you know, next six months to three years. Next slide. Sorry, I'm running through these so quickly, but we have a lot of information here, and I still got a couple to go, and we got about 10 minutes left. So, U.S. headline uh, CPI hit 7.9% in February 2022. That was literally the largest increase in 40 years, right? Uh, 40 years, so since uh, 1982, we haven't seen inflation like that. Uh, the invasion of Ukraine caused tremendous amount of uncertainty. We know that. Uh, Short-term volatility, variety of commodity prices surging. We just looked at that in the charts, creating <coughs> those immediate inflationary pressures that are now starting to ease off. Longer term, we expect structural factors such as aging demographics, high global debt levels, and the onward march of technology and innovation to keep inflation near central bank targets in the coming years. So what are we saying? We believe that inflation rate is going to come down gradually, right, over the next year to two. Next slide. So global growth versus U.S., um, Again, and this is just another uh, source other than the Wells Fargo Investment Institute, this is PGIM. Uh, they uh, reduced the global growth forecast from three point, down to 3.7, 4.1%. See U.S. growth decelerating, right? About 5 or 6 growth all the way down to 3.6. So these are big decelerations in growth, and that's one of the reasons you're seeing a big downward revision in stock prices, right? If uh, earnings aren't going to grow as predicted, then the stock prices need to come down uh, to recognize the uh, slower growth in both the U.S. and overseas. So again, given the potential headwinds for growth amid rising geopolitical risk, inflationary pressures, the probability of stagflationary environment, although low, has increased. Uh, next slide. So monetary policy, talk about that real quick. So we just saw our first Fed increase in the uh, Fed funds rate, right? So it went from 0 to 0 0.25 to 0 0.25 to 0 0.5, a uh, uh, 25 basis point or 0.25% increase. We're expecting anywhere from six to seven more hikes this year. So what is that going to do? It's going to bring that super short-term rate, and it's going to bring it up significantly from literally being on the floor to, you know, 1% to 1.5% by the end of the year. The good news is by the end of this year, you could see CD rates that are a lot more attractive than they have been over the last, oh, let's say 10 years. Um, you could also see bonds, whether it's munis or treasuries or uh, corporate bonds, uh, a lot more attractive compared to the stock or equity market, but not now. And I'll show you why here in a second. Next slide. So this was a you know slide that was about a week ago, and they they're projecting the uh, ten-year Treasury yield to end at 2022 at 1.8%. Well, right now and today it's trading at 2.3 to 2.4. <clears throat> In the last week, it's gone from 1.92 to 2.4. Which, you remember, bonds real quick. You have yield on one side and price on the other side, and so if the yield is skyrocketing, what does that mean? It means people are selling bonds. And it means the price of those bonds is going down significantly. A 1% increase in a you know, 10 year treasury is a 10% fall in the value or the price of that bond. And that's exactly what we've seen uh, over the last month or so. And so again, in our per specific portfolios, we've been very, very underweight, underweight 
uh, bonds, particularly for this reason. It's something that I, I cautioned about in January uh, when we had the inflation discussion. I said, if you're carrying bonds, especially longer term bonds, and chasing yield or chasing income on those bonds, you need to be very, very cautious, is what I said in January, because if rates rise precipitously, then it's going to hit you from a, a, a price standpoint um, in, a, in a very um, uh, in, in a way that we haven't seen bonds move in a long time, all right? And that's what we saw, all right? So again, I caution you, uh, if you're a retiree, obviously you don't want to own all stock, but I do caution you on what bonds you own, especially on the longer end of the curve. You want to be very, very careful uh, of what you own. Next slide. So here's, put it to um, uh, a, a chart here. We can see here uh, 2012, roughly the beginning of the year in 2000, or excuse me, 2012, yeah, excuse me, uh, about 1.4%. So over the last 10 years, we've gone from 1.4 to 2.3. But as recently as, you know, March, right? I'm sorry, January 20, <laughs> excuse me, December, between de December and January of 2022, right? We were trading at 1.4% and now we're at 2.3. Not quite a double, but about an 80% increase in the yield on the 10-year treasury, which I can't even begin to tell you how massive a move that is in the 10-year treasury. And we could see more like that, or we could be peaking right now like we were in the commodity markets. Regardless, we think that you definitely need to be in your portfolios underway to these longer-term bonds. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to skip this because I just covered it. So next slide. So here's our gasoline prices, right? Our weekly gasoline prices. And again, this is only takes us back to, uh, you know, late January of 2022, uh, where Suzanne has the cursor there is where we are in March. Um, so I would expect if you know, say, hey, Ryan, uh, what do you think is going to happen to gas prices, et cetera, et cetera. I would expect usually it trails the price, uh, the price of West Texas Intermediate. So uh, our bio gasoline could probably uh, come down uh, another 50 cents to a dollar. And then we'll hit the summer driving months, uh, particularly in California. We moved to the new uh, type of gasoline in the summer. Um, and so you could see prices uh, hopefully stabilize where they are right now. I know many of you are paying over $6, maybe even some at $7 a gallon in certain places in, in SoCal. Um, even up here in the Tahoe area, uh, in Reno and Carson, uh, we're looking at, you know, five, five fifty a gallon. And up in Lake Tahoe where I live, you know, we're at six fifty a gallon. So very similar prices uh, to Southern California. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is don't worry, you're not alone. Unfortunately, as we know, gas prices affect the the, the most impoverished and the, the, the lowest income earners in our uh, society disproportionately. And so this is something I'm certain that the uh, administration and the, the Fed, everybody's taking a look at. I would expect um, there to be some policy moving forward, maybe hopefully at the state level or at the federal level to bring these prices down at least to a rate um, uh, that we've seen before, uh, but I think the days of seeing two and three dollar gasoline is probably gone. We're probably looking at the four to five dollar gasoline going forward. Next slide. So, very last thing here I want to get to is just to be, you know, looking forward. So, how far away are we from recession here in the U.S. and what what are the things that are telling us that we don't expect a recession right now? Well, you know, I did this presentation back in 2019 here at UCSD about the inverted, something called the inverted yield curve. And what we look at is the difference between the rate on short-term treasuries and long-term treasuries, right? We call that the yield curve, and it's really just the U.S. Treasury yield curve. And this is the yield curve. If we look at the blue line, right, so that's the yield curve as of 3-17-2021. And what we say in the industry is you have a steep yield curve. That's when you want to be putting money to work. You want to be putting money in the stock market because that indicates that we have a very strong economy. As the curve gets flatter and flatter and flatter, we begin to approach uh, an area where we need to be concerned. I, you know, if we go green, yellow light, yellow light, red light, I wouldn't say red light, but I would say as we start to get a flatter curve, that's a yellow light. That's indicating that there's going to be some excess slack in the economy, that there's a recession looming, not next year, not the year after, but within the next, let's call it three to five years. Once the curve inverts and you have short-term rates that are higher than long-term rates, that's when the yield curve becomes one of the best predictors of recessions of all the tools that we have to predict recessions. And when that yield curve goes inverted, then we're probably normally looking at 12 to 24 months before a recession. The yield curve in the United States uh, inverted the, in late, if I recall, late 2020. And sure enough, we had a recession in March of 2020. 
March, April, May of 2020, right? So again, the yield curve is probably our best predictor when it comes to potential inflation or potential recessions in the future. So right now it's not signaling a red light, it's signaling a yellow light. So you still probably wanna be overweight stocks, underweight bonds, but that could change pretty precipitously because that short end of the curve, right? On the very, very left side of this graph is what the Fed is raising right now. And that's what, you know, we talk about the Fed and why so many people follow the Fed and, you know, why the Fed is watched so closely. Well, in our economic cycle and the way things work here in the United States, the Fed is pretty much the driver of recessions most of the time. Of course, we have these exogenous events like pandemics, wars, um, but the reality of it is the driving up of short-term interest rates is what really chokes off demand in this country, and that leads to a recession. Next slide. So again, what it means for investors, and I'll just read this, yield curve is flat materially, but it's not inverted. Credit spreads have widened. Uh, these metrics are consistent with deteriorating economic conditions, but have not crossed over into the levels that would suggest a recession is likely in the next 12 months. Using a stoplight analogy, which I just used, we've gone from a green light to a yellow light. So caution is warranted, but I would not be overly pessimistic regarding portfolio risk positioning at this point. Next slide. Um, possible NATO penalties. This I added about a week ago, and <laughs> almost all of them have already happened, so I'll go ahead and skip this slide. Next slide, please, Suzanne. Thank you. So again, potential economic investment implications, our last two slides here, there's little direct trade between Russia and the world outside of Europe. So remember that, right? Both the sanctions on Russia and damage to sentiment likely will squarely fall on European economics, European Union. Russian sanctions are likely to reduce the Russian commodity exports, right? Especially energy into Europe, while any fighting weighs on European household and business sentiment. So it's a confluence of events, certainly a reduction in supply but also a reduction in sediment. And that's going to be much heavier in the European Union and already has occurred more so in the European Union and the United States. All right? Nevertheless, expecting 2022 domestic consumption in the U.S. and parts of emerging Asia to produce above average economic growth, any incursion in Ukraine may add inflation pressures and encouraging long-term rates high. All right? And so that's exactly what's happened. Next slide. And here's my final slide in the summary. Overall, Again, the current commodity wars, we believe, will lead to higher and more persistent inflation around the world, abating from the highs that we just saw this past month, including in the U.S. However, the U.S. recession is highly unlikely right now. We do not have an inverted yield curve, right? All, all signs are pointing to uh, economic growth still continuing here in the U.S. We have a very tight labor market. We have increasing wages. Uh, inflation certainly needs to come under control. Fed monetary policy is still supportive. Uh, but it's becoming more hawkish. This is not usually when we see a recession. And we reiterate our preference for U.S. stocks, U.S. large caps and mid caps that don't re rely a lot on borrowing. And you want to, uh, again, be underweight Europe uh, and underweight emerging markets and particularly long duration bonds. So I will stop there. I know that's a lot. And that was a uh, very um, technical presentation. But it's, um, you know, you get into the commodity markets and you start looking at some of these charts and what they're telling you. And uh, uh, it, uh, um, some of the, the picture of what, how the world has reacted to Ukraine and the incursion of Russia really starts to come, um, become apparent. So with Ryan, that. Ryan, that was really uh, excellent.